Hello and welcome to Atlantic Conversations. I'm Fanula Sweeney. The Atlantic Fellowship Programme works with a diverse community of leaders around the world with a common commitment to fairer, healthier, more inclusive societies. Through its seven programmes focused on equity and healthcare, socio-economic equity and racial equity, the Atlantic Fellowships offer those leaders an opportunity to gain new perspectives and new colleagues, while strengthening their confidence in their work for change. In each podcast, I'll be speaking to an Atlantic Fellow about their work and ambitions for a more just world. For this series, I travelled to Cape Town to meet up with some of the first Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity South Africa at Takano. Today, I'm joined by Kense Khadebe, Head of Social Impact at the South African College of Applied Psychology, SACAP. Kense is also Executive Director of the SACAP Foundation, which helps provide accessible and affordable mental health services in Cape Town. I asked Kense what had attracted her to the area of mental health and about her desire to provide access to better mental health care. My background is in sociology, but when I graduated and began working, I started working for an organization that trains mental health practitioners. And that's when really my eyes opened up in terms of the gap for services and for accessible services. For example, in South Africa, we only have 2.75 psychologists for every 100,000 South Africans in the public sector. To access services in the public sector, you will usually wait for a long while. Currently, what the statistics tell us is that for every one individual that needs to access mental health care services in South Africa, three won't be able to access them. Are people in South Africa perhaps more in need of mental health care because of the composition of society, history, and other societies? I think globally, mental health is a hot topic, and I think that a lot of policymakers have come to recognize that. But in South Africa particularly, we come from a background of extreme violence, extreme inequality, extreme poverty, and that really affects individuals. So it creates real trauma in the lived experiences of individuals, and people underestimate then the need for mental health care services. So people may not know that they need access to mental health care. Definitely. And if they do know they need access to mental health care... Will they try to sweep it under the carpet? Some individuals might feel that in their culture, in their context, mental health is stigmatized. So then they won't actually reach out for help. They'll feel like this is something I should be able to deal with by myself. Can you give me an example of in what way it's stigmatized? You'll find most people don't understand individuals who do have mental health care illnesses. So you might find that, let's say there's a family member who's suffering from mental health care illness and they'll get locked up in a room and they won't be allowed to go outside because they might be seen as embarrassment to the family. And that often then makes individuals who might have even a basic mental health illness not want to be associated with anything relating to mental health. Health care needs to come to them. Yes, it actually does need to come to them. And what we find in South Africa is the community mental health care services are severely lacking. So you'll find that a significant portion of our national health care budget goes to tertiary services. So those are all our psychiatric hospitals where you have serious cases of schizophrenia and other mental health illnesses. But at the community level where you can do a lot of preventative work, you find that that work actually isn't being done because those local community clinics are overwhelmed. Is there a lack of enthusiasm among the community itself or is it just that the clinics are overwhelmed? I would say it's system itself that is overwhelmed. A lot of the work that we've been doing is going to local clinics in and around Woodstock, the area where I work. And a lot of the practitioners there have been saying, oh my goodness, we're so glad that you have a service because we actually don't have the capacity. Let's look at that. What kind of service do you provide? We provide short-term interventions. So that's four to six weeks face-to-face counseling. And that's dealing with individuals who are experiencing a particular life crisis. So something's happening at school, something's happening at work. Grief, trauma, you were in a car accident, somebody broke into your home, and you're trying to recover from that. Does it involve medication prescription? No, no, it's talk therapy. And then for individuals who have more serious cases, then we have a built-in network. We will be able to refer you to somebody who'd be able to assist you with that. Does that assistance go beyond the six weeks if necessary? So yes, after the six weeks, you can go into one of our support groups. But if you need further one-on-one counselling, then that's taken on a case-by-case basis. Do you know how much of an impact your programme has had? We've just started working now in January 2019, having our first cohort. So a lot of that evaluation work is going to happen probably at the end of March. And then we'll begin to see what is the impact that we're having and whether or not we need to rejig 
our own system. And does this program stay regardless of the surveys or what comes back in terms of the research? We've got funding to pilot the program for one year. The results that we get from our own survey and our own research will inform how we're able to secure funding for the following years. But our vision is to do that. Are you confident that the landscape for access to mental health care can change in South Africa? Definitely. I think that over the last three years, especially after the Life is Demeni tragedy in South Africa, where some 140 patients actually died in facilities across South Africa because they were placed in psychiatric facilities that were under-resourced. That really put mental health care on the map in South Africa. And civil society has been pushing for government to invest more resources in mental health. So I think that we're coming in at a prime time where people are having conversations around mental health and they understand that we have to educate individuals around mental health. So there's less work that you have to do when you go speak to funders. The minute you say mental health, people are like, oh, I understand what you're talking about. Do you feel the stigma has been reduced as a result of this tragedy? To some degree, I would say yes. When you go speak at universities and colleges, students are much more readily able to admit that, oh, I actually suffer from depression, or I've got anxiety. In those spaces where I think individuals are middle class, they have access to better education, there's less stigma. But in contexts where that isn't the case, so rural areas or in spaces where people aren't as knowledgeable around mental health, then people might still explain mental health away by saying, oh, it's witchcraft. And then that increases the stigma. Access to general health care seems to be quite an issue, not only in urban areas, but particularly rural areas. It's something that fellows from this program have talked about. Being part of this group of fellows here in Cape Town at Takano, how has that impacted your thinking or your approach to your work? I think for me, it's made me realize how much more strategic I have to be in making the case for mental health, because you begin to really understand that if government is investing 80% of its resources in tackling communicable diseases like HIV and TB, because they feel like you can actually see somebody suffering with that illness, that when you're coming in and saying, let's find mental health, you actually have to make a really strong and clear case using good evidence-based research to make the case for why being able to ensure people are functional in their daily lives, why that's a positive impact and why that contributes to actually improving the health outcomes of citizens in this country. I'm much more confident of how much investment we're going to have to make in ensuring that the outcome and the impact is positive and that if it isn't, how do we then change that to ensure that we get the results that actually benefit our primary users? Do you see your work going beyond Cape Town? Do you see it in a regional or global perspective, given that there are other health equity programs as part of the Atlantic Fellows programs? Yes. For the South African context, particularly in the next three to four years, the vision that we have is to actually expand our face-to-face services. But a gap that I've noticed is that you can provide very similar services leveraging off of technology like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. So I'd like to see us be able to reach more individuals using those technologies because then that makes it more accessible and it can bring down the cost of the service. And in terms of connecting with fellows from other programs, do you see it could be of mutual benefit to fellows and other health equity programs or areas where they may be working along lines similar to yours? Definitely, especially if they're using tools and resources that we can learn from and apply in our context. For me, that would be the most useful thing, even if they're not necessarily working in mental health, but maybe they're thinking about a particular solution in a particular way that we can then leverage off and learn from each other. That would be most beneficial. Well, Kenzie, thank you very much indeed for taking some time to join us. Thank you. That was Kenzie Khadebe, Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity South Africa at Takano. For more information, you can visit www.atlanticfellows.org. I'm Fanula Sweeney, and you've been listening to the Atlantic Conversations podcast.